This is Brian Kurtz again. Just wanted to go through uh, a little bit more detail in this section. Had to divide everything up in order to uh, comply with the uh, YouTube uh, upload limits. But uh, wanted to run through a couple other features on this particular design and then show you some of the other uh, things that we have going. Uh, after this, we'll have one more section showing some of the IPs that are available in this flow as well uh, for things like up conversion and custom FFTs. So in this block, we went through and we saw it run at uh, 400 megahertz um, push button for a standard uh, fur block. Of course, this can really be done for anything that you can design, um, you know, matrix operations, anything in particular. But there's a, often a common need to bring things in from the outside world that really aren't at the data rate. So in this case, you might need coefficients, and you might want to reload those from a processor interface. So rather than require to essentially, which you would do in the old version of the tool, to, to bring in the data, latch it, and then um, present it to the multiplier, is we have a simple block here that allows you to specify a register offset. So this is a register address. Some number of bits in that register address. Assign it a type, which are these two blocks, an initial value, and a description. And what the tool will actually do is when you run the tool, is it will take all of these individual registers that exist and roll them into one processor interface that is actually an Avalon slave interface. And if you're familiar with Altera, that is the interface that works with SOPC Builder. So you can bring this component directly into SOPC Builder, hook it up to a NEOS processor or any other uh, bit of Altera IP, and use that to actually control and set these registers. Um, it not only works for single registers, but you can do it for do it to get registers back out. You can do it for shared memories. So really, just a simple way of getting that level of abstraction out of the out of the way. So that's something we just wanted to quickly point out there. Uh, another really nifty thing about this that we didn't get into a lot of detail on on the last Cordis run is that this does actually save us quite a bit of time during fit and compile. And the primary reason for that is that. Currently, it's very common for designs to require register retiming in order to meet their performance, uh, particularly when you're dealing with designs that are running north of 300 or 350 megahertz. Uh, what this actually does is, because the registers are placed in the optimal locations for the design, you don't have to rely on the tool to do register retiming, and the results work out about the same either way. So the be benefit of that is, is you can cut your compile times down substantially um, by not using register retiming, although that feature has been enhanced uh, and is not nearly the additional time sync that it that it used to be, um, so that was kind of what we wanted to present on this this tool. Now this is obviously a very simple design, so I wanted to go to something that was equally conceptually simple, but has some more uh, intricacies worth pointing out. So this is a simple IIR filter, uh, pretty simple. Um, there's a lot of stuff surrounding here for control. Uh, information and it's primarily because we actually have 20 channels running in sequence in this so it's a channelized design so we have a couple blocks here to help help decode that for us uh, you can see that we also um, are targeting 450 megahertz of a clock rate and if I drop down into the design you can see that we're also working on Stratix 3 which is the shipping 65 nanometer product that we have so if we drop underneath here uh, we can take a look at the design and you can see it's very similar to the fur filter. We have an input and an output. Again, in this case, we only needed one data in. Uh, we have a data valid and a channel as well. And in this case, the channel basically is used to encode which of the 20 channels we're currently using. So in this case, it's a simple IR filter, uh, very, very kind of textbook organization here. You can see this individual feedback paths that loop back around. So in this case, we have the forward branch, and in this case, we have the feedback branch. And these things usually create a lot of complexity because you've got to make sure that the timing is balanced throughout. So in this case, because we have 20 channels, we actually need 20 clock delays between each stage. So if we were only doing a single channel, you'd only see one delay here. But by doing a multi-channel design, there's actually 20 delays in each of these. And what Advanced DSP Builder will do is it will recognize that it has these delays available and it will suck it back into the rest of the design. These individual delays, and it will use some to pipeline the multiplier, some to pipeline the adder, uh, some to pi pipeline this multiplier, and all these individual blocks. And if you can see over here, you see this latency 
equals 18. That kind of gives you a hint of as to how many it actually ended up using to pipeline the design. Uh, so that means basically you'll see 18 clocks of delay from when the valid asserts here to when it comes out over here. But again, within the design, you don't see any latency. So if we go ahead and run this, um, go ahead and generate hardware, either indeed is the, the little notch filter. I'm not going to rerun Cordis uh, through here as it will take, uh, you can see it took a minute 53 and that's uh, a good 20% of my YouTube time. Um, but you can see that the FMAX here, uh, I don't know if it's legible at uh, 320 by 240, but it achieved 480 megahertz push button. So it just kind of an idea that indeed um, this methodology is robust. It actually works for feedback paths uh, just like it does for feed forward paths. Um, a lot of the control that would normally be associated with a design like this, the state machines, the scheduling of a multiplier is all abstracted for you. Um, and all these individual things are, are available. So again, um, the next section we're just going to run through real quickly and show an FFT and a duct design using some higher level constructs, so something that's perhaps a bit more useful. But all of this is available in the 8.0 release of Cordis, uh, which ships uh, officially on June 2nd. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to contact your Altera rep. Thanks. So for the final section, what I'd like to do is show you what this means in a larger system. So we talked earlier about how one of the key markets for this is going to be remote radio heads. So doing um, digital up conversion, digital down conversion, crest factor reduction, and uh, other sorts of algorithms. Uh, what I'd like to focus on for the next five or six minutes um, is WiMAX up conversion. Uh, so if you look at this, we've got a couple different things. Um, we took a look at some of these primitive blocks. But we also have a few other IP block sets um, that we didn't go into in as much detail. Here are the processor bus interface blocks. We also have some filter blocks, so decimating, interpolating CIC filters, uh, interpolating uh, uh, and decimating uh, fur filters, including half band or, in fact, nth band, single rate filters, and then fractional rate filters. And then the other thing we'll mention briefly is a couple of base FFT blocks um, for radix2 squared butterflies and other type of uh, blocks like twiddle generation um, that are just useful to build your own FFTs and, and why you might want to use that. So this, at the very top level, is a Stratix uh, 2 based uh, WiMAX up converter with two antennas. Um, so for WiMAX, you come in at about 11.2 uh, megahertz. Uh, this design actually has it at the older 11.424 rate. And we selected a Stratix 2 uh, 60 design uh, to run at a 182 megahertz rate. Um, could, run it, could have run it faster, but it's a pretty common and, and nice number uh, for a demo um, because it's a nice power of two multiple. In this case, this is about as complicated as the up converter gets. And if you look at this, you can see all these kind of gray little blocks. These are all IP blocks that we provide. And you can see that's really all the design is. There is no other hierarchy than what you see here. So the entire design was done with on the order of 10 to 15 blocks. Um, so if we just start at the very beginning, you can see there's some information that we have. Um, just like on the primitive blocks, we have data coming in. So in this case, one data line. Uh, we have a valid and we have a channel. So if we come through and we look at this and we were to simulate it, uh, what you're going to see is a bunch of blocks pop up. And what these are is just basic different data points showing us the simulation as it runs through. 